Mainly on base reflex boxes on this one, or I should say um, ducted vent boxes, or, uh, because they're not quite the same thing. Uh, because they're the, sort of the, the ones that you're most likely to see, and there are, truth, truth be told, they are popular for a very good reason. Uh, for the majority of people, they work best, uh, or some variation thereof. Uh, because more complicated speakers introduce their own lists of compromises. Uh, if anybody ever tells you that they've got a, so a speaker that's designed well without compromise, run the other way because everything's a compromise full stop, as you know, in speakers as with anything else. And I actually deliberately picked that picture because that is me. It's a bit like Carl Sagan in there. Anybody ever watch Cosmos? Probably the greatest, the greatest series on science ever made. Bless him, Cal died, I can't believe it's 20 years ago. Uh, that we are standing, you know, on the edges of the, our science, on the ed edges of the cosmos, and we're about ankle deep. And we've got the whole oceans ahead of us. Uh, any, again, if anybody tells you they're an expert at anything, run the other way immediately. Because they're obviously uh, far too self-satisfied. Uh, I'm not an expert at speaker design. I'm always learning, and I hope to God I always continue to learn. Uh, many things I thought I knew uh, turned out I didn't, you know. And uh, this is, this is what continues. So yes, that is that is me looking at the water, thinking I quite like that. So I've given up flying things in. I don't. How the hell do we move that? I see. I'll, uh, position this appropriately, so, yeah, uh, I thought I'd sort of quickly start, start this one off with a quote from Tom Danley of Danley Sound Labs, they of the biggest subwoofers known to mankind. Uh, Tom is an absolute lunatic in many ways, but he's also a phenomenally knowledgeable chap. And he keeps coming out with this comment, they said, the ancients keep stealing all my best ideas. So every time he thinks he's come up with something new, it turns out that some clever sod going back through sort of Bell Labs records or Western Electric or RCA. So I said, um, you do know those guys actually played about with that in 1930. There's nothing new. The only things that are really new are digital manipulation of signals. And that's about it. Because the lads at Western Electric, Bell Labs, RCA, they beat us to everything apart from that, essentially. Digital, they didn't have. Beyond that, they had everything. They had resources like you wouldn't believe thrown at them. They, the top engineers at these guys were um, having salaries in the middle of the Great Depression, six figure. That's not adjusted for inflation. That's six figure salaries. They were being paid 100,000 plus in monetary terms of the era. Because these companies, they were trying to do the most with the least, like all good engineers do. And they had the resources to just throw stuff at it. And they tried, and they tested, and they measured, and they invented, and they measured some more. And they kept on doing this. Dr. Harry Olson, probably the godfather of modern audio. Absolute genius. Brilliant, brilliant engineer. About the only other thing that we've got, compared to the ancients, uh, along, along with digital, is certain modern materials that they didn't have easy access to, or the ability to create, and that really is about the lot. Uh, engineering enclosures and systems is largely a matter of using these developments, and traditional stuff as well. Uh, digital carrier mediums, manipulation of signals, all that, yeah, that's about it. Field small parameters, arguably it's more smalls work rather than fails. Um, although they're often lumped together, they didn't work together, they worked separately. Uh, they are effectively a method of applying electrical filter theory to loudspeakers and to a point, loudspeaker boxes. Um, which is great. It's, uh, it was a big, big step forward to a point. 
I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you'll notice that I don't fly things in on this one. I gave up when I was doing lectures constantly at whole university and just thought, hang on a minute, this is too much of a distraction. What types of enclosure there are, as I said, I've mentioned, I'll sort of focus on the reflex, but just reflecting on it briefly. You've got open baffles. They can either be flat, they can be U-frame uh, with the edges angled back, or open back boxes, which are just a variation of uh, another variation of the open baffle thing. It's just a box that doesn't have a back on it, you know, surprise, surprise. Uh, and H frames, which look like a sort of square section tube, you've probably seen them, in the middle of which there's a flat baffle on which you mount the loudspeaker drive unit. And that's, that's your H frame. You've got sealed boxes. S subtle difference here, you've got a sealed box, relatively large. You also have the acoustic suspension designs, smaller, they load the drivers a bit more. That's the variations on the thing, uh, but ultimately they're all sealed boxes. Uh, they're not. They're often called infinite baffles. They're not an infinite baffle. An infinite baffle would be an infinitely large baffle. Uh, you know, that's. Uh, I don't know where that one came out with, but uh, <laughs> that's what happened. Vented box types. You have base reflex boxes, uh, vented or ducted boxes which are related but not quite the same and you've got backloaded horns which have driver chambers in them these don't these don't have a uh, driver chamber they're chamberless um, but the majority of back horns that you'll see um, with very few exceptions have got some kind of chamber in there it's a low pass filter chamber they are the ultimate extreme in one direction of the base reflex thing Oddly enough, and equally, you could say that the base reflex is the ultimate extreme of the backloaded horn taken in the other direction. Yeah, they're all some variations on the vented boxes, and there is, at a very very basic level, some commonality in the physics. And that's about it. Quarter wave designs, um, you can have them that are straight. Surprisingly enough, they're straight. They don't have any taper. You can have um, narrowing versions, so they're tapered down towards a smaller terminus. You can have expanding versions, which are what frugal horns are, to an extent. Uh, if it expands towards the terminus, there is some kind of half wave activity going on. That's just the laws of physics. I can't do anything about that, nor can anybody else. Uh, as in, you might as well give it some kind of handle. That's your hole. And then you have transmission lines. Now technically, and it's never used in a stricter sense or as narrow a sense, a transmission line um, which takes its name from electrical filter theory and electrical transmission lines, has one object in mind, it's to pro provide the flattest possible impedance, no other considerations whatsoever. Uh, Bailey, who referred to the transmission lines back in the late 1960s, uh, his uh, article was called an acoustic transmission line or something like that, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, and then he, proceeded, then he proceeded to describe a box which had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with a transmission line, as it clearly did not have a flat line impedance. So, um, yeah, he could, I think uh, dear old uh, Alfred Bailey probably caused more problems in transmission line, was the cause of more bad TL design or quarter wave design than pretty much anybody else, not deliberately. Uh, it just was an unfortunate title. Fail small parameters, oh yes, the holy grail. Uh, maybe not. And frequency responses, okay, they're largely created by small. Uh, his doctoral work in Australia in the 1970s. Um, lightly derived from Thiel's work, which was itself predated in the early 1960s by a chap called Novak. His formulas and whatnot uh, just disappeared. Uh, you can still get them, it's in um, a paper you can buy for about 20 quid if you're interested. Um, you know, it's a twas ever thus really. Uh, and again, as mentioned, it's a, basically it's about applying filter theory, usually electrical filter theory, to moving coil drive units and enclosures. 
which is great. They are extremely useful. Uh, the problem that we have is that that can blind us to the fact that um, they are a mathematical construct. Certainly, Q is a mathematical construct. It doesn't necessarily have a direct physical meaning. It's just, it is known as the it's shortened version of quality factor, and it defines um, the nature of the resonance at the driver's resonant frequency. That's all. Uh, it's, it, these things are extremely useful, but they are not fixed. Which is the point that is often overlooked in all of this. Field small parameters aren't fixed. Surprise, surprise, they change. Driver break in, I hate the phrase, but you know what I mean, um, is one case, nine times out of ten, you will find, after you've run a driver for X, Y, Z amount of time, uh, you'll find that the resonant frequency is dropped. You'll probably find that the Q is moderately stable. You might see a small shift. VAS will have shifted as well. Uh, and that's just what happens as the suspensions work in. Marks drivers uh, require sort of running in for slightly different reasons. They don't change about as much. We only get a small change. I'm, I'm sure Mark will... I don't know if he's around, but he'll probably confirm later, but you know, that's what happens. But ultimately, these things vary with drive level, how many watts you're putting on the jacks. Uh, environmental conditions, they change. If it, is it cooler? Is it hotter? You know, uh, is, it, is the humidity up? What altitude are you at? They vary. Amplifier output impedance. You get a set amp, typical uh, output impedance of set amps, uh, or most of the ones I measure, and my, friend, my great friend Greg Monfort in America, um, they typically measure about 2.5 ohms to 4 ohms output impedance. You put 4 ohms on the end of one of these drivers, the Q is going to change. It's going to rise significantly. That needs to be factored in. If, because if you've designed a box for assuming a given Q, and in fact you then put it on the end of an output impedance of 4 ohms, You've raised the queue, there goes the alignment, bye-bye. So they are not the be-all and end-all, although they are extremely useful. Uh, one, po one point I would recommend that you take away if you're going to start designing speakers that you haven't before, just think about that, if nothing else, especially if you happen to have an interest in set amps or even some push-pull amps, actually. Uh, some of Nelson Pass's solid-state amps like the Zens, the first watt things, again, pretty sort of high output impedance, low damping factor amplifiers. You will change the behavior, particularly of single driver speakers where they're essentially directly connected to the amplifier without any sort of filter components in between. So do bear that in mind. Do bear these things in mind. And try and give yourself a bit of a fudge factor if you can. Uh, you know, it's, it's that these things are significant. So it's, it's about using them, um, but using your nous and knowing how best to apply these things, which are very, very useful. But, you know, it's, a, it's the application of. I always call wild speaker design. It's, yes, there is science to it. There's also, art, as Mark was talking about, yeah, it's what I tend to call the artistic application of science. <laughs> Uh, it can sometimes be a bit of a blackout. Uh, also, you do a sort of plot out a mathematical curve. Yeah, we plug it in, plug a set of TS parameters into a box design program, or do, plot it out yourself on graph paper, uh, and you'll get a nice, perfect mathematical curve. Yeah, but there's the speaker doesn't actually necessarily follow that in, a, in the first place. Loud speaker drive units have their own frequency response. It will, at some point, broadly conform to that shape. But also don't forget that if you've got manufacturer's map, um, frequency response, um, that is going to hopefully have been taking on an IEC compliant baffle in an anechoic chamber, of, uh, and you don't, they don't bother telling you what the conditions are. They don't tell you what the baffle size is or anything like that. So again, you know, the, the response will shift about a bit from, compared to that simple curve. 
and that's before we factor in a few other things as well, they are basically then TS parameters, they're a snapshot of a driver's performance under a given set of conditions. Uh, they do provide a broad indication of behaviour, but don't take them as gospel. That's if they are broad trends and they're a guideline. But if you, it's like anything, prescriptive, uh, slavish devotion to a set of given mathematics. We don't live in a mathematical world. We live in the, uh, a sort of a physical world that is flawed, badly flawed. So, you know, trying to apply over-precise mathematics to things that aren't actually necessarily that precise in the first place is not necessarily going to give you uh, anything much uh, that's particularly worthy of being termed perfect or anything like that. So we have an illustration of this. Textbook alignments, assumption of idealised mathematical conditions. Now you can have uh, a maximally flat der uh, derivation of a base reflex box. Uh, this was a set of equations come up with don by Don Keel. So you've got uh, VB, volu box volume, equals 15, 15 times the VAS multiplied by the QT of the, of the effective QT of the driver, once you've accounted for any output impedance of the amplifier or, or speaker cable resistance or whatever. Multi so multiply that by the effective QT uh, raised to the power of 2.87. There you've got a box volume. Box tuning frequency is 0.42 times the resonant frequency multiplied by QT raised to the power of 0 0.9 and you will get an F3, the minus 3 decibel uh, point, at 0 0.26 uh, multiplied by the resonant frequency multiplied by QT raised to the power of minus 1.4. <sighs> God help us! You know, I mean, most, most box design programs will also, sort of automatically do this for you. That's actually Keel's derivation. There are others as well. QB3 is slightly different. Don't worry about it too much. Sealed box, you get similar equations as well. These are the raw equations. If you want a different Q, uh, this one I used a maximally flat um, alignment, which is zero point, the QTC of 0 0.707. Uh, you can plug in whatever. So down from... 0 0.5 up to infinity, and you'll get the appropriate volumes and whatnot out of that. So, based on those, you have a pl the Pluvia 11 box, ducted vent reflex, or whatever, should have a, vol a volume of about 11.14 litres, a box chilling frequency of about 49.5 hertz, and it's minus 3 point under these idealised mathematical conditions, will be about 56.5 hertz. Yeah. Okay, and there you have them, and uh, two different programs, that's Unibox and the other one's uh, program from uh, Jeff Bagby, uh, and you can see the black line is the system response, the red line is the vent tuning, because these are bandpass devices, they work over a specific frequency and then roll off above and below it, and uh, you don't worry about the blue lines. Uh, and again, you get that's just using Jeff's. And again, dark blue, that's your system response. Light blue is your uh, vent output. Don't worry too much about the others. All well and good. Apart from the fact that um, that red line is what happens when you take that box, that mathematical box, and put it uh, about 0.8 of a metre off the deck, uh, about half a metre in front of a front wall, and about 1.2 metres off the side wall. That's what happens. That's what rooms do. The room dominates below about 300 hertz. That's basically fact. In 99% of conditions, probably 99.99% .99 of conditions, that is it. You have to factor the room in if you want to have a decent, practical box. And again, that's not actually including... Um, the location of the vent, which will change things somewhat. It's not including the nature of the room acoustics, how much damping is there, what's the furnishing like, how thick are these walls, what are they made of? Thin wall construction, like a lot of Americans have, you know, clapboards and that stuff, often with insulation between, leeches low frequencies like you wouldn't believe. So all of these things have to be factored in. And that's, again, before we consider a few other things, like 
diffraction and step losses, which are unfortunately somewhat irritating. Um, 